So, at Leviticus chapter 21, the first 15 verses of that chapter, and it's going to deal with, well, the purity of the priests, looking into, well, how are they supposed to live within society? Uh, because as we explored a little bit beforehand in the book of Leviticus, uh, life in God is not limited to just, well, Sunday mornings. It's not defined by the boundaries of this church. And if we're living as Christians in this world, it's not just going to be in the worship service, but in all aspects of life. So uh, God is giving specific regulations for the priests. How are they supposed to live? Uh, especially in regard to their marital relationships. Um, because as we also explored a little bit previously in the in a few chapters uh, before this one, that the first commandment and the sixth commandment are very much interrelated in terms of you're supposed to be devoted to one figure in particular. So uh, first commandment is you shall have no other gods, so you're devoted to God. And sixth commandment is you shall not commit adultery, so you're devoted towards your spouse. Uh, but uh, let's get into that uh, after, after we pray together Psalm 39. Psalm 39. I said, I will watch my ways and keep my tongue from sin. I will put a muzzle on my mouth as long as the wicked are in my presence. But when I was silent and still, not even saying anything good, my anguish increased. My heart grew hot within me, and as I meditated, the fire burned. Then I spoke with my tongue, Show me, O Lord, my life's end, and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting is my life. You have made my days a mere handbreadth. The span of my years is as nothing before you. Each man's life is but a breath. Man is a mere phantom as he goes to and fro. He bustles about, but only in vain. He heaps up wealth, not knowing who will get it. But now, Lord, what do I look for? My hope is in you. Save me from all my transgressions. Do not make me the scorn of fools. I was silent. I would not open my mouth, for you are the one who has done this. Remove your scourge from me. I am overcome by the blow of your hand. You rebuke and discipline men for their sin. You consume their wealth like a moth. Each man is but a breath. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Listen to my cry for help. Be not deaf to my weeping. For I dwell with you as an alien, a stranger, as all my fathers were. Look away from me that I may rejoice again before I depart and am no more. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. So we're going to be going into Leviticus chapter 21, verses 1 to 15, and this is starting off a new section in the book of Leviticus. So in the previous section, section 18 to 20, uh, this that was dealing with the civil laws. This was for all people of Israel. Now in 20... 1 and 22, we're going to be focusing on the priests themselves. Now, structurally within the book of Leviticus, this is matching something in the earlier section, uh, earlier part of the book, I should say, because the book of Leviticus is in a chiastic structure. And I've talked about this in previous devotions that I've done on this book. Uh, but basically, this is uh, the beginning matches with the end. The second part matches with second last, third with third last, and then you, you get to the the uh, height of the middle, which is going to be the focus of the book, and that was uh, the Day of Atonement, uh, chapter 16. So with uh, chapters 18 to 20, this is dealing with uh, the civil law of Israel, as well as um, an outworking of the moral law. So how are the people of Israel supposed to conduct themselves within the nation of Israel as those who are the people of God in the nation of Israel? And all these things link back to uh, certain certain uh, commandments, uh, most notably the first commandment and the sixth commandment. So you shall have no other gods and uh, do not commit adultery, because with these you're devoting yourselves to somebody in particular. And this is going to come up as a bit of a theme in chapter 21 as well. But anyways, uh, so proper devotion to an individual. Now these laws match the cleanliness laws in chapters 11 
to 15 in the earlier part of the book. Because chapters 11 to 15, you're supposed to only uh, eat clean food, what is considered to be clean food, the one the animals that God designates for you to eat. Uh, there's also uh, cleanliness specifically towards the body, so infectious skin diseases as well as any uh, infectious disease that might be on a house or clothing, so you could even think of, say, mold or bacterial growth, a specific type of bacterial growth that would actually be visible. Uh, but also there's laws regarding um, sexuality. So with the men, this would be expulsion uh, in the sexual act, or what's supposed to be expulsion in the, se in the sexual act. And then for women, it is uh, blood flowing from, uh, during, during their periods. Because uh, these things are not what God has necessarily ordained them for. So for the woman, uh, her womb is supposed to be a source of of life, so it's supposed to nurture a child and birth a child, so a blood symbolic of death in this sense cannot be uh, is, is cannot be mixed with the sexual act which is supposed to produce life for the child. Uh, men, if, if, um, if their bodily fluids that are supposed to be devoted towards the sexual act with their wife uh, get expelled at a different point in time or just outside the womb in general, like this is considered to be um, unclean for, for men, that uh, this thing which was devoted, supposed to be devoted for creation of life is not being used for that uh, specific use. So we find that with chapters 21 to 22 in the book of Leviticus telling us, well, what are the priests supposed to be devoted towards? What are they supposed to be doing? Uh, we're also going to be finding uh, prohibitions, like in earlier chapters, about what not to do. However, in the earlier chapters, there's no set of laws, regulations except, exactly that uh, deal with or match with what's going on in chapters 21, 22. What we actually find in the earlier chapters is the divine service where Aaron becomes high priest, his sons become priests, and then they have the first official ceremony for the forgiveness of sins of the people of Israel at the tabernacle, tabernacle being the tent place of worship. So uh, that's happening in chapters 8 to 10. And at chapter 10, we find that there's something that does go wrong at this time. So Aaron's oldest sons, Nadab and Abihu, or if you're using a bit more uh, Hebrew pronunciation, uh, Nadav and Avihu, uh, these two figures, they do not do what they're supposed to do, and they are killed right then and there by God himself. In fact, they are uh, burned with a fire uh, uh, that's supposed to be for the sacrifices, that God's, God's, God's flame would consume the sacrifices as a replacement for the people's sin, but since sinners sinned right in front of him, his fire consumed them, uh, rather than the sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins because they were not doing what they should to actually produce a proper offering. So it was not acceptable to the Lord, so God took them in his judgment. So when we get to chapters 21 and 22, now we're going to be looking into, well, how are you supposed to properly conduct yourself? So Nadab and Baihu, they would be the figures that you do not want to follow. So how are you supposed to properly be a priest in God's kingdom for the forgiveness of sins of the people? How, how are you supposed to be an intermediary between God and man offering sacrifices for the forgiveness of sins? So we're going to be dealing not just with... Um, uh, not just with how you conduct yourself, but who you are actually supposed to be. So, without further ado, uh, we're going to be getting into chapter 21, verses 1 to 15. And there's going to be a number of uh, different regulations that God has here. So I'll be breaking up the reading of the verses to try and explain what's going on with all those. Okay. So chapter 21, beginning of the first verse. The Lord sent to Moses... Speak to the priests, the sons of Aaron, and say to them, A priest must not make himself ceremonially unclean for any of his people who die, except for a close relative, such as his mother or father, his son or daughter, his brother, or an unmarried sister who is dependent on him since she has no husband. For her he may make himself unclean. He must not make himself unclean for people related to him by marriage and so defile himself. 
So I'll break there. What on earth is going on? Okay. Um, so for us in the Christian church today, this is somewhat removed from us in the sense that we don't follow these cleanliness laws. Uh, the cleanliness laws were specifically for the people of Israel, specifically for worship at the tabernacle and temple. But once Jesus Christ came, uh, him being God in flesh, well, his flesh itself is the tabernacle for us, the place of worship for us. So if we're trying to direct our worship to God, we're actually doing it through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And Jesus Christ interceding on our behalf as our great high priest is not only the temple, but the priest who is uh, presenting a greater sacrifice, which is also Christ himself, to God for the forgiveness of our sins. So um, when we're directing our worship, it's always through Christ. And since Christ is a greater high priest, a greater temple, a greater sacrifice than everything that has come before. Well, Christ has actually made satisfaction not only for our sins, but also for our uncleanlinesses. God has actually wiped these out from us. So uh, even though we find a whole bunch of specific cleanliness laws for the nation of Israel, such as you're only supposed to eat such and such foods, um, if you come into contact with such and such mold or, or infectious skin disease, you can't do X, Y, Z. Um, yeah, these don't exactly apply to us anymore because Christ has fulfilled the law so that uh, for the forgiveness of our sins and also to cleanse us from our uncleanliness. So it, we're not going to be as stringent about our uncleanliness uh, in a spiritual sense as, as the Israelites were. Now, we definitely still want to be, be physically clean because there's still actual diseases in the world that will pollute the flesh. But Jesus Christ, his blood has delivered us from sin and death itself. So these things won't actually pollute our souls nor uh, make a barrier between us and God for proper worship. So with Christ, we can actually rejoice, yay, we are not unclean. And because of this, and because this, we're now about 2,000 years out from, from when Christ made his sacrifice for our forgiveness, uh, it is kind of foreign for Christians to try and stringently follow any cleanliness laws. And, and the people who do are not actually following the scriptures as they should, because we actually find this even being addressed in the New Testament. Um, so when... When we look to passages like this, where the priest is forbidden from going near any dead body, well, what's going on? Well, this is actually some of the cleanliness laws. Because if a priest, well, if anybody, any anyone gets close to a dead body, they would actually be considered unclean. Because this is, well, death. So if you get to somebody's dead body, you are in the presence of death. You are made unclean by death. You are, and in a physical sense, we can understand this. Because with a decaying body, yeah, especially a decaying body at this point in time before there was any such thing as refrigeration or uh, a morgue. Like you can't really keep people uh, physically clean to the extent that you would actually need to keep them physically clean. So people uh, would actually be susceptible to physical disease. But in the spiritual sense, you're actually being uh, defiled by going to this dead body. So you need to be cleansed. And after a period of cleansing, then you can go to God, who is the source of life. So you're not trying to bring uh, the death of this flesh into the presence of the worship of God, because God is not the God of, of the dead. He's God of the living. So he would actually produce life within us. So in Christ, we actually know that, well, since he is life within us, we can actually get near dead bodies. and We don't have to fear contamination in a, in a spiritual sense, because Christ is constantly bringing his eternal life within us. So, um, at this time, everybody would, would be contaminated. So, uh, for God, he wants his, his servants, the ones serving him at the tabernacle and then later on the temple, he wants them to be clean, ready for service, ready to forgive the sins of other people in the nation. So they can't just uh, allow themselves to be unclean at any point in time. They need to... They, they have to devote themselves to the Lord. So they're, they're holy because they're devoted for a very specific purpose. They can't um, make themselves unclean and thus remove themselves from the proper vocation which God has called them to be in. So 
Uh, God gives the exceptions only for close relatives, somebody whom they need to mourn. So this would be father, mother. And this is also going to be related to the fourth commandment. So you're honoring your father and mother, making sure that they have a proper burial. Uh, you can also have brother because, well, who is your brother going to rely on? Because as if you look at the property model, everything is going from father to son. So the sons are the fellow inheritors. So if your brother dies, well, who's going to take care of him? Well, odds are it's going to be you. You are you're going to be the one to take care of him, because, especially if he doesn't have any uh, children old enough to, um, to, to bury your brother. So if you don't have any nephews who can do that and, and take care of the family responsibility, then it, it's definitely up to you. So you have to do that for your brother. And then it's also here for an unmarried sister. And that's being specific because, as I just said, uh, property inheritance flows from father to son in this culture. So if you are uh, a married woman, then you're not belonging to the family that you were part of, that you were born into. You are now you're part of your husband's family. So your husband uh, would and his family would take care of you uh, if, if you passed away. But if your sister is unmarried, then she doesn't have... Uh, anybody to take care of her except your own family so you have to keep it within your own family and you have to help her out so that's why there's this caveat for for the unmarried sister so yeah no cleanliness uh because sorry um don't do this because you'll become unclean unable for service proper service of god um oh yeah and i should mention that this actually comes up in the new testament so the most, like quite arguably the most famous parable of all, uh, the Good Samaritan. Jesus gives a couple examples of people who pass by the Samaritan who's beaten up on the side and, and uh, naked at the side of the road. And it would be a priest and a Levite. So the priest, if we're talking about priests here, Levites would be, well, people of the tribe of Levi. So the, these laws are still somewhat uh, pertaining to them, but if if you're not made a priest, then you could just be called a Levite in general. So anyways, a priest and a Levite pass this guy by, and the odds are they're doing this because they don't want to be uh, made unclean because of contamination with this fellow right there. Because if he's lying by the side of the road, being up, well, he could actually be dead, so they don't want to become unclean because they have service services to perform at the temple. So that's why Jesus is bringing that up. And like, how, how far are you willing to love your neighbor in this sense? And are you loving your neighbor so much so that uh, you are willing to forgo your cleanliness to save them? Or are you going to try and uphold God's law to such an extent where it's not reasonable anymore? Because who does who is the Samaritan actually going to rely on? Because normally if somebody just dies, well, yeah, of course it would make sense for the Levite and the, and the priest to, to stay away because, well, other people can take care of this guy. But if it's at the side of the road, who is who on earth is going to take care of this guy? So if they follow the law by the letter, they would forego this. But if they actually follow the law by the Spirit, they realize, oh, this guy actually needs uh, help or even burial. And I'm the only one who might actually be able to do this. Because that's, that's more the idea of talking about the father, mother, your, um, brother, and, and sisters, that these people are depending on you. Okay, moving on. Verse 5. Priests must not shave their heads or shave off the edges of their beards or cut their bodies. It must be holy to their God and must not profane the name of their God. Because they present the offerings made to the Lord by fire, the food of their God, they are to be holy. Okay. So stop there for a bit. What's going on here? Well, this actually did come up in um, chapter 19 in the book of Leviticus. This was also a prescription for uh, the whole whole nation of Israel. So it came up in chapter 19 verses... Do, 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 do. Ah, here we go. Uh, 27, 28. So do not cut the hair at the sides of your head or clip off the edges of your beard. Do not cut your bodies for the dead or put ta tattoo marks on yourselves. I am the Lord. So, um, 
what these things are, are marks of mourning for pagan cultures. So when God brings it up here for the priests, he's, he's emphasizing, well, these things you should not do, because if you're doing these things, even in piety towards me, well, you're not actually doing it because I say so, you're doing it because these other pagan cultures are doing it. You're doing it because false gods are demanding it of their people, or the people themselves think doing such activities will invigorate the dead or, or invoke spirits, whatever it happens to be. So basically this is saying, do not do these actions because you are following a different God. You are made holy for your God. You're supposed to be offering sacrifices to your God. So if you're actually following the law of the Lord, you wouldn't be trying to do any of these uh, extraneous activities to make God look at you, to make him feel sympathetic for you and go like, ah, oh, this guy is a pious person. No, you would actually just follow the Lord's word because this is directing how you should act. And I'll touch on um, kind of a medieval Christian issue, and it, and it still has implications for what's going on today. But um, there's things called works of supererogation. You go, what? What is that thing that you just said? Well, uh, supererogation is basically working beyond anything that you're expected to do. So um, irrigation is, is doing works, super irrigation going beyond those works. So super irrigation was expected within the, the medieval Christian church in the sense that you would be doing enough works to work off time in purgatory here in this world. So this would include things like uh, pilgrimages, prayers for the dead, blah, 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 blah. Um, these works of uh, super irrigation were meant to make you more pious than than uh, than you actually needed to be. And the issue with this was uh, essentially works righteousness because it is trying to say that you are getting more from God if you give more works. And this is not the case because God sets an actual standard for this is what you should be doing. That's called his law. And if you go beyond that, well, God does not promise you any greater rewards. He's just saying, you're supposed to be doing my law. So if we follow the law, we will receive the promised rewards that God has actually given to us. And we do have mention of rewards in the Gospels. Like Jesus says, um, uh, lay, up not, lay up not treasures, sorry, not accumulate treasures for yourself here on earth, but lay up treasures for yourself on, in heaven. Um, so what Christ is actually saying there is, well, don't try to do public works for everybody else's approval, but actually try to please God. And pleasing God is the best thing that you can do, and you'd actually be rewarded in, in kind. So it's not as though you're trying to earn grace, you're trying to earn salvation, but uh, you can actually be rewarded for living according to how God has told you to live. Not making it uh, for the purposes of being greater than other people, but uh, doing it simply because God says. Now, the problem with works of super irrigation beyond just like these aren't actually going to get you more stuff. Uh, the problem then became, well, also the publicity angle because people were trying to be more pious than thou so that other people would uh, recognize them as great saints here on earth and give them uh, uh, worldly praise instead of godly praise. But uh, some of this has kind of gotten into the, in the place of um, creating new laws for you to perform. And we can actually see this with the Pharisees themselves at the time of Christ because they were trying to institute laws that were not just hmm, for the priests according to God's word, but they were trying to do laws beyond those laws. So uh, not only were priests supposed to wash their hands before entering into the sanctuary of the of the tabernacle. Well, now everybody was supposed to wash their hands, but not everybody's supposed to go into the sanctuary. So everybody's supposed to wash their hands for a lot of stuff, including before every meal. And the Pharisees themselves um, uh, asked Jesus, well, why aren't your disciples washing your hands? This, this is in Mark chapter seven. And Jesus goes, what are you talking about? Like, it's not anything that comes from the outside that makes you spiritually unclean. It's what's from the heart that will actually make you unclean because out of that you have a whole bunch of other things. So Jesus actually starts condemning 
the Pharisees for their traditions, including the washing of hands, kind of adapting something in the Old Testament for, for something much wider. And uh, he's then bringing to an example where uh, you, you, you Pharisees are encouraging people to, to offer up greater offerings to God, uh, very pious acts, and in so doing, actually desecrate the law in other areas, because if you're offering up certain things, then that's detracting you from helping out your own family members. Um, so within the medieval church, we actually find this going on still, where people are neglecting their proper duties to try and do great and extraneous works. In fact, this is something that Martin Luther himself condemns uh, all over the place, because this is what he found in the monasteries, was that uh, people were becoming monks not just to try and serve God and uh, actually serve the people around the monastery, which was why monasteries were originally made, was so that uh, you would have a devout group of people in connection with the surrounding populace, and then the monks would actually be able to help the surrounding populace and, and preach to them and do a whole bunch of stuff. Well, now, the, now people were just trying to devote themselves to being holier than thou, and uh, they were creating new systems in order to receive grace or, or forgiveness or what have you. Um, and, and a lot of it had to do with the purgatorial system. But yeah, it, it's a kind of misappropriation of what you're supposed to be doing. And you're trying to create new laws in order to just, and, and try to ordain that this is how God wants things. That was what the Pharisees were doing. This is also what the Roman Catholic Church was doing and, in my opinion, still is to a very big degree, uh, even, even post-Reformation. But that's a different topic. So what we're supposed to be doing is what God says, uh, and if we do not do what God says, well, then we're not properly worshiping. Okay. So verse 7, um, the priest must not marry women defiled by prostitution or divor divorce from their husbands because priests are holy to their God. Regard them as holy because they offer up the food of your God. Consider them holy because I, the Lord, am holy. I who make you holy. Okay. And this is going to come up a little bit later on in the text too with um, with uh, proper marriage. But I'll stop here for now to try and comment on it. So priests must not marry anybody who is who ha who was a prostitute, nor divorce from their husbands. So uh, the divorce from the husband is also uh, linking into the concept of adultery. Uh, we'll find this in other parts of scripture, other parts of the, the Pentateuch, like I can remember very vividly, like this is in, in Deuteronomy, where we get um, comments by Moses on certificates of divorce. And if anybody divorces their wife, or divorces their husband, it could go either way. So if, if there is divorce, um, this is to be because of, well, a forfeiture of the intimate union of husband and wife, so there would be some sexual dalliance here and there, uh, which would ca be cause for disruption of the marriage. But uh, anybody who marries the offending party is guilty of adultery at that point in time because this person should have actually been faithful. Uh, they're not. So in effect, this is kind of marrying a prostitute. So if you marry somebody who has been sleeping around, this is uh, a horrid affair. Uh, they should be devoted to their to their spouse in the first place. So the divorce is to try and um, remove the non-guilty party from the guilty party so that the non-guilty party can actually be sustained in their livelihood. They don't have to support somebody who's um, uh, working against them. But that doesn't mean that uh, the person who is guilty gets to go off and do whatever they want now. They, they're still, uh, still considered to be in the in the offense, uh, in the wrong. So that's why we have these things. You don't want to have um, a misunderstanding with, with uh, the sexuality. So now we'll get into, <laughs> uh, in today's culture, we'll, we'll have a whole bunch of objections uh, getting into, well, that's just discriminatory against women. Why get, how come women 
can't sleep around, but men can. Well, if, if you read the previous chapter and the couple chapters before that, you actually find women and men are not allowed to sleep around. In fact, we find that anybody who's committing adultery, uh, they are to be stoned to death. So if anybody is having sex outside of marriage, not having a proper marriage, uh, this is not to be. This is sin in the community, so no, don't do it. So we're not just trying to single out women here, but we're trying to recognize proper purity. So in the marriage relationship, the ideal case is always going to be a, uh, a virgin male with a virgin female. Okay, That's always going to be the ideal case. For priests here, though, what we actually find is that since it's a prohibition against uh, marrying women who have been divorced, prostituted, um, well, actually, this, is, this also belongs to the entire nation. So there's actually no uh, forbidding of marriage of anybody who is a widow or, or a widower. So priests can marry a widow. Priests can also marry a virgin. Uh, priests can themselves be a widower. They can go into a, a marriage relationship beyond that. But uh, yeah, you, you're not supposed to do somebody. You're not supposed to be engaged in the marriage relationship with somebody who is intentionally going outside, of, intentionally committing adultery. So this is about purity of the priest before God. They are not to be um, influenced this way. And with the New Testament text, that would actually deal with this. We have to go to First Corinthians because, of course, we do, which deals a lot about. Uh, a lot with sexual sins and, and uh, proper marriage. And there in uh, chapter 6, St. Paul is saying that uh, anybody who joins their body to a prostitute is actually one with that prostitute. So if you have sex with a prostitute, you're basically in a one flesh marriage union with her, whether or not you actually acknowledge that. And uh, that would be true with any number of people that you're joined with. You'd be in all those sorts of relationships, so you're all... And all those merit, those uh, relationships will be polluted with uncleanliness because you're being connected with all those men or women um, at the same time who are also engaging in other relation, sexual relationships. So it's it's uh, just kind of wrong on the face of it. So St. Paul is saying, like, you are made pure for God. Christ has made you pure. You're in the body of Christ. So why would you join yourself to prostitution? Why would you join yourself to adultery? This is going the way of idolatry, not just adultery, but following other gods, namely looking to, to sex instead of the one true God and, and trying to follow uh, your downstairs brain rather than uh, the Holy Spirit given within you to make you a holy temple. So uh, this is not to try and be discriminatory towards women, nor even towards men, uh, but we're just trying to uphold the purity as God has assigned us to be in. That is, we are to ideally be with those partners who are um, devoted to us in a good and honest marriage without any adultery uh, during or, or even before. Okay. So we have here a um, special stipulation. This is verse 9. In Leviticus chapter 21. So if a priest's daughter defiles herself by becoming a prostitute, she disgraces her father, she must be burned in the fire. And you go, wow, that's, uh, that is something drastic. And honestly, it really, really is. Because we don't have too many punishments of uh, being burned in fire. Now we can just kind of look over at Nadab and Abihu because they were burned by God's fire uh, when they offered um, an unfit sacrifice. They're, they're consciously disregarding God's laws to God's face at the tabernacle, so they, they were uh, judged by God. Um, now they were not burned unto ash, which is more the punishment of uh, being burned in fire. But they were burned. Uh, when you see uh, anything burned to fire like this is absolutely destroying it. So the actual custom of the Jews was to bury their dead. So when you stone somebody, which is the usual method for executing somebody within the people of Israel, you would still bury them, and you you would still hope that well maybe they had they would have repented and maybe they would be in the resurrection to come. Um, but the typical method of burial by the Jews is is oh, sorry typical method of taking care of the dead in Jewish custom is burial, 
And this is absolutely looking forward to the resurrection from the dead. So when you have burned with fire, this is saying like, this is so horrible that we cannot allow this at all. Even, even the memories of those uh, people who committed offenses and were stoned, we can still have them over there, but this we cannot withstand at all. This has to be burned to ash and, and completely destroyed. So uh, in this way, it's, it's very similar to uh, sin offerings in the sense that you are burning the entire animal, the entire sacrifice. And you are reducing it to ash because God is consuming that, that uh, animal as a replacement for you. So according to your sins, your most horrible sins, you would be consumed in, you would say, like hellfire. So uh, rather than for you to face that type of judgment from God, uh, the animal is being a substitute for you, a substitutionary atonement for you being destroyed in, that, in such manner. And there's nothing left. And when there's nothing left, there's also nothing left of the sin in that area. So for a burning, as a punishment for breaking, for breaking a law, um, this is trying to remove the sin completely from among you. Um, yeah, so that person is dying their sin completely and trying to remove the sin entirely. So we have that here. It was also mentioned once in the earlier chapter, Leviticus chapter 20, and this is, um, again, somebody having sexual relations with a mother and her daughter at the same, like, not, not at the same time, but having relations with them, being in their house, cohabitating with them, and, and stuff like that. Um, so that was, that's uh, extremely offensive. That was, that was also a uh, prescription to burn all of them. So usually in the cases of adultery, you'd stone both parties. But yeah, for this, burn all of them. Uh, with this, also burn it. So why is this so offensive? Well, basically, a priest's daughter, uh, to be a prostitute, well, she's in a holy family, and if she's in a holy family, she is not to become a prostitute. So normally prostitutes stoned because they're guilty of adultery. Priest's daughter, she's called to a higher, a higher purity than anybody else. So it's not just the priests who are called to a higher purity in front of God, but also uh, everybody else in the family. So... The priest's daughter, if she engages in prostitution, she is actually desecrating her father, his household, and making him unsuitable for for proper worship of God at at the tabernacle. Now, women are not to be priests; they can't actually do that themselves. So, instead of uh, the the daughter disgracing herself and she just not being able to go into the sanctuary, just by being the proximity of her father, her father becomes unclean by by his um, uh, living with her, and she has to pay the penalty for this. The sin must be uh, eliminated. So this is very, very drastic. Okay, uh, continue on, verse 10. So the high priest, the one among his brothers who has had the anointing oil poured on his head, and who has been ordained to wear the priestly garments, must not let his hair become unkempt or tear his clothes. You must not enter a place where there is a dead body. He must not make himself unclean, even for his father or mother, nor leave the sanctuary of his God or desecrate it, because he has been dedicated by the anointing oil of his God. I am the Lord. So here... And we're looking not just at the priest, but the high priest. The high priest is the priest above every other priest. In fact, uh, the high, there is only one high priest for the entire nation of Israel. So this is the spiritual head of the entire nation in terms of intercession before God. And uh, we find the high priest being extremely important in the Day of Atonement, the Day of Atonement being for the sins of the entire nation. Only the high priest can go to the Holy of Holy Places in the tabernacle to make satisfaction for sins, uh, the sins of the entire nation, and also for them. And we see that uh, if there is a sin personally committed by the high priest, the sacrificial animal has to be offered is on, the sa is on par with the sacrificial animal uh, animal if the entire nation sins. So the high priest is basically representing the entire nation of God, so they're called to an extremely high um, status of, of uh, holiness. So the one who has this, like he's supposed to be at the pinnacle of this, like not even his hair must, must be unkempt. Uh, he must not uh, tear his clothes in mourning. So he 
So everything must be holy and pure. Um, and uh, he is not to go anywhere where there's a dead body, uh, including, including for his father and mother. So he is not to leave the sanctuary of his God. So he's not supposed to go uh, really beyond the tabernacle itself. So he must stay in that area because this is to what he's devoted. He, he is there for the people of Israel. He can't go beyond this. So he, so even the most close relations with him, so with regular priests, like, yeah, you can go who bury your father, mother, brother, or unmarried sister, but with high priest, no, <laughs> can't do that. Now, interesting um, issue we actually find is in the New Testament. <laughs> Um, so when Jesus is making himself known and gearing up to be the superior sacrifice for the people, that is, going to the cross for the forgiveness of all sins, not just having a repeated sacrifice of animals day after day, month after month, week after week, year after year, depending on what type of sacrifices we're actually talking about, Jesus is going to be a sacrifice once for all. He's also... Uh, going to do this as our great high priest, the high priest greater than any of the other high priests, because he himself is without sin, with, completely without blemish, whereas other high priests, they've always had to cleanse themselves before they can make an offering, uh, a sacrifice. So they are, so after they have um, made a sacrifice for themselves, then they can offer sacrifice for them people, but for the people, but then immediately they've become unclean because they're human beings who are sinful. So they need to offer another sacrifice, and then they can sacrifice for the people. But then they're sinful, so they have to offer an offer sacrifice. So again, the high priest can never really uh, take away sins in the sense that uh, they also... Well, sorry, prepare the way to the inner part of the sanctuary for the rest of the people. That would be a better way to phrase this, because they always have to sac make sacrifices uh, to forgive themselves. So Jesus, being without sin, can actually open up uh, the way to God the, the inner part of the tabernacle, the holy of holy places, Jesus can open up heaven to us because he is without sin. So uh, when Jesus Christ is really starting to make himself known, uh, we find that, well, uh, people want to kill him <laughs> because they're going, because they think that he's going against God, whereas Jesus is God and they're really against God and they don't recognize the irony. So, after Jesus is arrested, he's put on trial before the Sanhedrin. And uh, the high priest, again, the head of the religious life of the entire nation of Israel, and, and uh, the high priest at this time is also kind of the unofficial political head of the people because their politics are now being governed by foreigners, uh, the Romans as well as uh, the Herods. So the high priest head of the entire nation, should be the one to actually decide things properly. And uh, he goes up to Jesus. This is uh, Mark chapter 14, verse 60. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. So again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. The high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need any more witnesses, he asked. You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him as worthy of death. So, a number of things going on. <laughs> but I wanted to highlight this uh, because of the drastic nature of what the high priest has done. Okay. So uh, you have the high priest representing the entire religious life of the nation. So if anybody should know the law of the Lord, it's this guy. Now he goes up to Jesus, who is God in the flesh, and he asks him point blank, are you the anointed? Why are you the Christ? Are you the Messiah that we're hoping for? And Jesus goes, I am. And the I am there is also Jesus using the divine name. He's using the emphatic I am in the Greek. So he's saying, like, not only I am the Christ, but I am God. <laughs> and he says, uh, you will see the Son of Man referring to himself. So he is the son of man in Daniel chapter 7, the divine figure in Daniel chapter 7, sitting at the right hand of the mighty one. So he's also saying that he's not only the son of man, the divine figure in Daniel chapter 7, but he is 
quite literally the son of God. He's at the right hand of this guy. So he has God's own authority in his teachings. He's coming on clouds of heaven. So for the judgment of the entire, so he's going to be the one who judges all people. So Jesus is putting a whole bunch of uh, divine imagery in what he's actually uh, describing. So, he, so he's not just confessing to be the Messiah, he's confessing to be God. So at this, the high priest is tearing his clothes. So, and he says, like, uh, you have heard the blasphemy. So when he's saying you have heard the blasphemy, he's actually acknowledging that Jesus is claiming to be God in the flesh right at this time. So the high priest rejecting this actually tears his clothes. So um, when we actually look into Leviticus chapter 21, where it says that it is forbidden for the high priest to tear his clothes, what the high priest is doing here is not just... Um, being overly dramatic like he is absolutely at a loss for everything he's he's just this is the worst offense that has ever come before me that somebody's claiming to be god right in front of me um so so the high priest is saying at once going like this is extremely drastic situation but he's also at that time so he's rejecting god so he's but he's also rejecting his own position as a high priest because high priests are not allowed to do this. So the high priest was openly sinning against God in the, in the presence of the entire Sanhedrin, the ruling body of the religious elites in Israel. And he performed this action and they condemned Jesus, not the high priest. Like the high priest broke the law of God right there, trying to condemn God in his midst. And the people decided, yes, let's condemn God, not this, not this sinner right in front of them. So the high priest is actually recognizing who Jesus is claiming to be, but also now removing himself as the proper high priest. So Jesus as the real high priest, the great high priest, is going forth even beyond this. So uh, little things, little things. So forever looking at the high priest, yes, they're called to the greatest purity, but the greatest purity of man cannot reach the purity of Jesus Christ our Lord, and we actually need him to suffer for our sakes at the cross, to actually be condemned to the cross for our forgiveness, that uh, uh, we might not die in our sins, because not even the high priest is able to skirt around sinfulness. Anyway, so the last couple, ver last three verses, I should say. So this is uh, verses 13 to 15. Leviticus chapter 21. So the woman he marries, so this is the high priest still, so the woman the high priest marries must be a virgin. So for the other priests, it says, do not marry a woman defiled by prostitution or divorced. Um, it, now it says, though there's no prohibition against widows here. And if you wanted to be safe as a priest, well, maybe you wouldn't marry a widow. But... Um, it does seem that widows are permitted, but in verse 13, it says for the, for the high priest, not even that, like they have to be a virgin. They have to um, be free from any other attachment <laughs> to anybody. Um, verse 14, he must not marry a widow, a divorced woman, or a woman defiled by prostitution, but only a virgin from his own people. So he will not defile his offspring among his people. I am the Lord who makes him holy. So for the, for the high priest, uh, with the defiling of offspring, there is, like, it, it's looking at the offspring being affected by the parents to some degree. And in truth, we can actually see this, um, not necessarily physiologically, like we can't see different physiological things going on there, but um, in terms of spirituality, yes, there, there's always going to be some sort of baggage from uh, previous relationships. So in order to keep uh, people dedicated to God in a specific sense, God is saying, like, yeah, you can't have your offspring defiled. Now, if we're talking about actual transmission of sinfulness, well, this is something very different because, like, everybody's sinful. Everybody will um, infect their kids because we're all carrying the original sin within us. So everybody is born outside of a faithful relationship with God, that is, in violation of the first commandment. Um, but even, even beyond this, we can say, well, everybody's going to be affected by those who are raising them. And we can actually negatively or positively impact those who, who are born. 
But as for mycin being visited on the child, no, we don't actually have this. In fact, Ezekiel chapter 18 features the Lord uh, openly denying that he will visit the sins of the father upon the, upon the son. Uh, so when God actually says, well, I will count the sins, father, against the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, um, in Exodus chapter 20 with the Ten Commandments, what he's doing is he's more looking towards the um, physical side of things, the, the natural side of things, worldly side of things, which is you are affecting your own kids, not, not the spiritual aspect of things. So uh, the, the offspring can't even be in a household where this, this might occur, this, uh, the baggage of having another relationship with the father. And in this way, um, the high priest and his marriage is actually supposed to mirror Christ in the church because the high priest, the great high priest, is Christ himself, of course. Uh, in fact, Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, gets into this quite a bit. Anyways, but with uh, uh, Jesus and the church, well, who is the church? Well, we could say it's a bunch of sinners. So how can we say that uh, we're, we're virgins, we're undefiled? Um, in fact, when God deals with his uh, people, and this is going to be Ezekiel chapter 17, uh, 16, and 17, 16 and 17, mostly 16. The idea still comes up a little bit in 17. But Ezekiel 16, um, God is talking about uh, his nation of Israel as a child that was raised, like you found in the wilderness, raised, married her as a virgin, and then she prostituted herself to other nations. <laughs> and it was a hor she was also a horrible prostitute because uh, she paid them <laughs> in order to have sex with them and or to prostitute herself with for them instead of them paying her for the prostitution. So, um, so rapid, rampantly uh, defiled, but God still has relations with his people. That is, he, he brings her back into the marriage relationship. And the idea is that God is purifying his people to the extent that we are a pure virgin bride, that we, are, we actually have none of the sins, former sins that we've had left affecting our relationship with God. And this sounds rather fantastic, especially when a lot of people struggle with sin in the church. It's like, how, how is this not um, affecting my relationship with God if I struggle with doubts or these temptations, et cetera, et cetera? Um, well, yeah, all of these are going to be major factors in how we live our lives as Christians. But we also have to remember that through faith, we are forgiven in Christ. So the Holy Spirit is constantly working faith within us. He's constantly applying the grace of Christ to us. He's constantly bringing us into the forgiveness of Jesus Christ, which Jesus Christ won for us on the cross. So, though we sin, yet shall we be holy unto God, because we are constantly receiving Christ's forgiveness. So, uh, as long as we're living in repentance, that is, not attaching ourselves to any sins, but constantly seeking out the Lord's forgiveness, which he is constantly giving to us, uh, then we're fine. But if we, but the caution should be in when people stop being repentant for their sins, because that's an indicator that you may have lost faith, that you may have cut yourself off from God and His and His Spirit, that you have gone off completely into prostituting uh, towards other gods, maybe the gods of your of your flesh, uh, God of your flesh, or maybe just God of sexuality or whatever your, your uh, personal demons have to be happen to be. But if you are in, in the faith, God is constantly forgiving you, constantly bringing you closer to him, constantly purifying you. So when we see the imagery of Christ and his bride, the church, it's in the New Testament, it's always how God is bringing a virgin bride to, to, uh, to Jesus. And Jesus is marrying her in her purity. And it's not on account of the virgin's purity, the church's purity, that she is pure, but it's on account of Christ's purity, his purity, his sinlessness, that she is being washed in uh, his cleansing power so that she might actually be uh, presentable as a virgin unto him. So for us in the church, this is great news for us. When we see all these uh, prohibitions against all these evils, or not even evils, uh, against all these uncleannesses in the Bible, we actually see in Christ, who's acting as our priest, our high priest, our great high priest, uh, 
we see some a standard far greater than anything we have had of old and a person far greater than all the sinners who have come before uh, even even sinners like me who are in the office of pastor i can't i can't replace jesus at all nor would i want to because i need him just as much as everybody else needs him so uh, whenever we're looking to the holy priesthood yes we're trying to emulate jesus christ but we always recognize well who makes us truly holy amen okay uh, let us continue on in prayer beginning with the lord's prayer Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord Jesus Christ, our great High Priest, you offered yourself upon the cross so that we who are sinful may be forgiven every sin. We thank you, O Lord, for this surpassing greatness that you have shown to us, that you have given to us through grace, through faith, through the Holy Spirit. We ask you, O Lord, to constantly protect us in our lives, to live good and just and holy lives here in this world, uh, so that we may do and be who we need to be. May you guard us in all our paths, may you rescue us from temptation, and may you bring us as a good example to others so that people may see you at work in our lives and come to you in faith. In your name, O Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. 